Hello, and welcome to the inaugural Dana Discovery Dialogues, a new monthly series of public webinars and discussions designed to dig deep into the most compelling and relevant subjects in neuroscience. The Dana Discovery Dialogues are being created through a partnership of the Dana Foundation and Boston University's College of Communication. My name is Mariette DiCristina, and I'm the Dean of the College, as well as a science journalist for many years. Today, our topic is brain organoids, and we're going to separate the myths from the realities about what they can do and cannot do. Brain organoids are clusters of cells that are grown in a lab. They are neuronally inactive and offer unprecedented opportunities in drug testing and disease modeling. They've also ignited some concerns around some science fiction scenarios about which we'll speak in a minute. Uh, but today's dialogue with our expert speakers will help you to separate fact from fiction on these intriguing brain models. Before I introduce our speakers, I need to just share a couple of logistical uh, points. First of all, if you're on social media and you're inclined to do so, please do feel free to use our hashtag Dana Discovery Dialogues. So that's just all three words mushed together, Dana Discovery Dialogues. Second, just a bit later during this dialogue, I'll be happy to take your questions and I promise there'll be a good amount of time for those. Feel free to put them into the Q&A box rather than the chat. And also you can put them in there anytime they occur to you along the way and um, I will come to them. This session is being recorded and will be available later on the Dana Foundation website, which is at dana.org, D-A-N-A.org. Last, we'll be sending our audience members a survey when our discussion is done today. And we hope you can uh, take a couple, just a couple of minutes to fill it out and share your feedback so we can continue to make these dialogues really rewarding and welcoming for you. Joining me today, we have Annie Kathuria of Johns Hopkins University, Lomax Boyd of Johns Hopkins as well, and Michael Stanley of the Boston Society of Neurology, Neurosurgery, and Psychiatry. We'll hear from each of them to get us started. So Annie, I'd love to start with you. Um, let, tell us please about your research with organoids and especially their potential therapeutic applications for human well-being. Thank you so much for inviting me. And yes, so I do work with these beautiful, if anyone can see the background, these beautiful cerebral organoids and just a, a very nice microscopy picture of a cross section of this. So I work with the field in the field of stem cells and particularly induced pluripotent stem cells. So induced pluripotent stem cells are um, cells derived from somatics, uh, stem cells derived from the somatic cells. So example could be, I took your hair cell or a skin cell and using the Yamanaka protocol, which was won the Nobel prize in 2007, 2008, we convert these into these naive stem cell state like. And the naive stem cell state gives us the opportunity to derive these into various cell types. And one of the ones, and that has been popular in the last couple of years is the brain organoids. And I particularly focus on deriving it for the prefrontal cortex, where I look at mostly neurodevelopmental disorders, such as autism, uh, some neuropsychiatric disorders, schizophrenia, and bipolar. And the aim for me is to use these cerebral organoids as a model to look at the, the disease from a cellular molecular point of view, and also from the possibility of looking at drug applications or doing therapeutic uh, dis drug discovery. So this is me in a nutshell. Uh, I'd hand the torch to the next person. <laughs> Well, and before you hand the torch, I just want to ask Annie uh, just a couple of quick follow-ups, just to make sure because, sure. Um, you know, it's it's a fascinating area. Not everybody's had a chance to to work in a lab like you have. So, if I understood you right, you might take a skin cell or hair cells, yeah. And then you mentioned that turning them to their naive state, so sort of turning them back the clock. They're not a skin cell or not yes. behavior, and, and so you're starting from scratch scratch again is that a good way to put it or yes yeah, so the uh, ips technology was first developed by yamanaka in japan 
uh, and they won the Nobel Prize. They first tried it in mouse. So what they took was took a skin cell or a skin biopsy from a mouse and then grew those skin cells and they reprogrammed them using various transcription factors or genetic markers, you would say, particularly. And then they reprogrammed into the stem cell state. So a naive state where a cell can be reprogrammed into its original uh, state of embryonic stem cell, you would compare it to an embryonic state where it can be then converted into any type of cells we wanted. So it's the reprogramming the, of IP, IPSC is basically reprogramming of a somatic cell, which is a hair cell, skin cell, they've done blood cells, they've done urine cells, all kinds of fun stuff now we can do. So we can reprogram them into this uh, stem cell naive state and then convert these into organoids. So this is super helpful. I just want to stay on this for one more second. Um, we reprogram, we take skin cells, reprogram them so then they can behave more like, not exactly like prefrontal cortex cells, which are. Yes. So we're doing cerebral organoids. So we do prefrontal cortex. The fascinating, or I, I'd like to say fascinating or the important aspect of an iPS cells or an induced pluripotent stem cell is. Uh, it carries the person's genetic signature, at least the genetic blueprint. So it, if I'm deriving one from my hair cell, it will have my genetic signature, at least the genetic signature. So then I can look at that person's genetic signature. And if they have a tendency to develop a particular disease, that should carry you forward in the organ that we're developing. And in this case is prefrontal cortex or the cognitive section of the brain. Okay. And then last quick question before we go to Lomax, thanks to your patients, Lomax and uh, Michael, is uh, we, we both use the word model. I think we should explain a little bit what we mean by a model for an area of the brain. A uh, model I mean, meant by is like, for example, so this is done in the labs. This is all grown in the lab. There are various kinds of models that we use to look at the different kinds of diseases. And I would say there's mouse models, animal models, drosophila, fishes. So in this case, we use the human IPS derived or induced pluripotent stem cell derived organoid as a model, if that made sense. Yes, thank you. That's super helpful. Lobax, uh, let's turn to you. I'd love to hear about your work. Yeah, um, well, great. Well, thanks, Mariette, for the invitation to participate. Um, yeah, I come to the brain organoid field uh, both as a neurobiologist um, and as, you know, a neuroethicist, you know, someone interested in the ethics, you know, related to the brain. And I think, you know, what's particularly interesting to me about this field is you know, not only can these systems, you know, shed light on, you know, the neurobiology um, of sort of the human brain, you know, which has been, you know, a very sort of difficult, you know, system to to sort of probe in the lab. Um, but I also think that brain organoids can be used to start to inform some like long standing sort of ethical questions about, you know, well-being um, and welfare, you know, when I think it's 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 interesting, you know, it's when you talk to sort of a, a neurotypical sort of adult human, um, you know, it's very sort of straightforward to ask them, you know, how they're doing, um, if they're experiencing pain um, or if they're experiencing pleasure, um, you know, they can sort of report back to you um, about whether they're suffering. Um, and we can even ask them questions that sort of probe their level um, of consciousness. Um, but immediately as you step outside of that neurotypical sort of adult human, and you start talking about non-human animals, um, whether they're close related primates or whether they're cephalopods or sort of avian species or, you know, brain organoids, you know, that have no capacity sort of to report out what their internal state is like, you know, our understanding of what the neurobiological basis of these morally relevant traits, you know, quickly sort of falls off. Um, and I think brain organoids offer sort of a very sort of interesting opportunity to answer some convergent questions between the field of neuroscience and the field of ethics. And I think we're just at the beginning to be able to make progress on some of these questions. 
thanks a million. Um, Michael, your your perspective is is that of a of a physician among other things. I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so very much, uh, Marriott, for having me uh, for as part of this discussion. Well, I have frozen. What a terrible thing to have happened. Can well, you hear me though? We can hear you beautifully. Oh, good. Then I'll continue, and you'll just think I'm having a very long sneeze. Yeah. But uh, but anyway, so yes. Uh, what I would say is I come to the uh, field of organoids as more or less an informed tourist to the field. So uh, although my undergraduate was in stem cell and regenerative biology, I've, I've uh, left that uh, stage of my life behind. And so more or less now what I am involved with is, is the care patients who are suffering from some of the conditions that someone like uh, Annie may be wishing to investigate. So on the one hand, uh, I am in some ways a conduit from the bedside to the bench because these are the patients or their loved ones are the ones asking about this kind of research and wanting to be participating or curious to be participating. And then on the other hand, um, uh, to some extent, the patients and the professionals that care for them are a goalpost to see how far that model is from the actual uh, uh, organ, the actual entity that we're discussing. So, uh, in some ways, it's uh, it, it's it's the 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 original and the primary thing that you're trying to get as close to as possible, uh, without encumbering itself with those ethical problems that uh, Lomax was talking about uh, that we're hoping to as well resolve. We may in fact complicate. So that's my part to play. Michael, I really appreciate that. I'd like to ask you a, a kind of a quick follow-up as well around these, um, you know, getting as close as possible. I've, I've heard it said sometimes that cancer has been cured many times in mice. Um, but there are challenges, I think, when we, because obviously we we can't use, uh, we can't we can't explore with humans in the same way that we might seek to do so with with other with some other uh, examples or models. And I think this this capacity of, of brain organoids to be closer to us and yet not us is a really interesting one. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, very much so. So uh, one thing that comes to mind is the nature of the model. Like we, we heard, for example, there are mouse models, there are human models. Uh, I would step back and I would think, wait a second, what is a model? And that actually, I think, puts the framework in, in, in a better perspective. So when I think of a model, and probably when most uh, of us think of a model, we're thinking of a model train, or a model plane, or a diorama, or our children's, you know, styrofoam ball solar system. In other words, we're looking at something that's descriptive. Its goal is to explain relationships by uh, either structure or uh, proximity, um, sometimes by shape or form. When, uh, in many cases, when a, a classical scientist or an empiricist is uh, talking about a model, what they mean is something that is reduced. All those details fall away. And what I'm looking for is just the basic building blocks that allow not just a structural relationship, but perhaps even a functional relationship, how the thing happens. You know, your child's solar system made out of styrofoam doesn't explain how anything works, right? Um, but these kinds of models, whether it's the mouse, which shares a lot of genetic information to us, and so as a result of that, its structures and its functions are quite similar, and then chimpanzees or macaques or, you know, uh, uh, apes are even closer to us, so maybe we say that those functional and structural relationships are even closer, and then at last, we get into things like an organoid, where in fact, we might be able to suggest that those structures that we put on the cell made out of uh, tissues derived or cells derived from uh, the disease in question may in fact have a relationship functionally that is even closer. So I look at it and say, we have to be very clear of what we mean by a model, because then that does uh, either distress or put to bed certain um, questions or concerns that may in fact e exist. The limitations of a model by being a simplified system um, makes some of the concerns we have really more or less science fiction rather than, uh, or, or very good armchair discussions, but not necessarily of any practical value. 
Um, thank you so much, Michael. That actually bridges to a question I already see. By the way, I love it that I'm already seeing questions in the in the Q&A. Thanks, everybody. So we, we've heard a little bit about the basics of uh, brain organoids, what they, some of the ideas for what they might be used for, and um, some of the interesting ethical both questions and solutions they might help point us to, um, which is which is terrific. Um, we we've heard some. Uh, there's a there's actually already a question in the in the chat around brain organoids and and how how soon they might be able to. This this says compete with the human brain, but maybe we think about any kind of awareness or or consciousness capacity and i'd like to start start with you annie because i i think this is this is a concern we've we've talked about i'd love to hear your thoughts so i would say as actually michael pointed it out very well uh we have to think it in terms of a model it's a very very basic idea of cells put together that have been derived from a human so again, it's not as I I don't worry about it turning into a conscious brain as of yet, anytime soon, <laughs> because it's a very fundamentally immature tissue. When we have looked at it experimentally to try to guess the prefrontal cortex is even aged the tissue that we generate in the lab. Um, and transcriptomically or genetically, what we when we've compared it to actual human postmodern tissue, it's not even close to a young baby. It's more close to post-week conception, 13 to 14 weeks of a brain that is developing in utero in the womb. So the idea that it can have consciousness is a little far away, I would say, in my opinion. I don't know when we will get to that point, never say never for a scientist. And I like to think of sci-fi anyways, but for now, I would say these models are just a glimpse in what we can do in the future. But we are very, very at the early naive or state where we're developing these tissues, trying to understand the basic neurodevelopmental processes that happen that we are unaware of and in the human body, particularly. That's what I would say. I see two really quick follow-up questions um, from the audience that I think might be helpful to, to do quickly now. Uh, one is a request for someone to define an organoid again, as the person is not exactly sure. I think we we had a go at it at the beginning, but, but maybe uh, maybe try that just one more time, just to make sure everybody understands what we're talking about. I, I should do it. <laughs> you don't mind, but anybody okay. could. Okay, uh, an organoid um, is, how would I define it? It's, uh, is uh, a bunch of cells derived from in my case, stem cells, uh, with the purpose of looking at, in particularly brain organoids, neuro neurodevelopmental pathways. These are similar to a human brain, but not exactly equivalent to a human brain. That's the distinguish distinguishing factor. Lomax, do you want to define it more from an ethical point of view? <laughs> Um, well, I, I'm not sure from an ethical point of view, but I, I think I think that was a great that was a great definition. I mean, they're basically the 3D clumps of human neurons. You know, they're um, they're very small. You know, we're talking centimeter size. You know, the latest is maybe millimeter sized, um, but they're they're th many thousands of uh, cells that clump together um, in a 3D um, organization. You know, compared to you know typically. Um, neurons and cells and labs are are kept you know, kind of in two D, uh, but these are are three D. But they're, you know they're very, they're very small. Thank you. Actually, Low Max, let's let's continue with you for a minute if you don't mind. So you you raise the intriguing points around ethical boundaries and how they can inform research. I'd love to hear more about this was this notion of welfare concerns or speeding clinical trials. Biocomputers, you know, these are some of the things that we talked about. I would love to hear more. 
Yeah, I mean, this is this is a very sort of deep, deep subject that we could spend the entire time um, talking about. I, it, you know, it's it often comes up the question of like, you know, when will organoids be conscious uh, or when will they sort of obtain those kind of capacities? And I think it's it's worth sort of pausing and recognizing that we don't know what consciousness is really uh, at the biological level, at the neurocomputational level, even at sort of the philosophical level, there are many competing ideas about what consciousness is. In fact, the only thing you can be certain of is that you're conscious, um, you know, from a philosophical perspective, you know, much less other beings, other non-human beings, much less things that are 3D clumps of human neurons in the cell dish. And so what I think we have here is sort of an opportunity to use brain organoids to start to sort of understand how neural systems do interesting and sort of complex things. Um, and before you jump to the end and start talking about welfare and well-being, consciousness and organoids, it's worth sort of recognizing what can sort of very simple, non-conscious, non-morally relevant things sort of do. And how can that inform our understanding of cognition? You know, there's an amazing set of experiments that um, I love to sort of think about um, that is taking not organoids, 3D um, clumps of human cells, but 2D clumps uh, of human cells, you know, so even less sort of sophisticated than organoids. And they were sort of used to understand what we perceptually experience as the cocktail party effect, which is basically you walk into a room full of a bunch of other people talking at the same time. And somehow miraculously, you're able to pick up and have a conversation with one person. Like you have, um, you know, isolated a, one signal amongst a myriad of signals. What's sort of amazing is that the 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 ability to sort of do this at the level of like neurons and level of cells um, is is that you can do this just in a, in a very simple culture of neurons that you can send them complex signals that's composed of many different voices, if you will. And then the neuronal culture itself will start to partition that signal into its, its various sort of signal components. Um, and I think that's something that we experience perceptually. It's not sort of morally relevant, but very simple systems that we wouldn't ascribe any sort of moral value to are able to do those things. And I think from there, we can start to understand what are sort of these neurobiological components that contribute eventually to things that are sort of morally relevant, morally valuable, that perhaps are components of consciousness. And then we can start to build up from the ground up, you know, what is consciousness and how would you identify it when you can't have a conversation with that being? That's, that yeah, that's a really thorny question. How could you know? Um, but let, let's switch back just for you know a minute to the treatment areas um, because I, I'd love to pick up on a, a thought, Michael, that you'd raised a little earlier around the model organisms and and, and things that they could do. And when you and I were chatting, we talked about about migraines and how how oh, they yes. themselves, you know, like so, how they, you know, just in terms of yeah, sorry. So so uh, this uh this idea branches off of um why choose one model over another, right? I mean, anytime you are selecting a model, whether it is a model organism, like uh, you know, a fly versus a mouse. Um, or uh, a, a system that's a, a little more synthetic, one might say, uh, uh, one that we produced. So that would be something like an organoid um, to even something uh, mechanical or even something uh, computational, like an artificial intelligence and, and mapping out what scenarios might look like. Those models allow and make accessible certain properties. So what is really cool about the organoid? Well, the organoid, as already mentioned, is not just a, a flat plate of indiscriminate nervous tissue that just happens to be there. And I'm looking to see, you know, does it, does it have a cell uh, receptor that catches this compound? But what does it do with it? How might these, uh, uh, I think Lomax had called it like, what was it, a bundle of, bundle of nerves or a bundle of something of that nature? A, a, a clump, I think it was clump, like a clump of nervous tissue. Well, okay. Are there certain diseases for which the composition of that clump is actually much more important than the individual parts itself? So there are a number of diseases uh, for which it seems to be, from what we can tell from looking at the people, that if it's if more is wrong across all the neurons, there's one gene and that gene affects all the neur all the neurons in the brain the same way. 
that maybe it's not as bad, the phenotype or the symptoms that they have is actually not as bad as when only some of those genes are expressed in only some of those tissues. Um, things like Rett syndrome, or there's a number of epile uh, uh, epileptic uh, syndromes for which not all the neurons are affected e equally. And in, in those cases, um, depending on the concentration of bad neuron to good neuron, you can actually get a worse outcome by having a 50-50 or 60% good neurons and 40% bad neurons. Well, how does that work? I, you would have no idea if you just had a flat plate of indiscriminate nervous tissue. But if you could take tissue from somebody who is, has one of those diseases where it matters more about the team of neurons rather than that there's just one gene affecting all of them and you plate and you grow that out and watch that, you can start to see how those networks might behave differently. Sort of in the same way that Lomax had mentioned that they're at least capable in many cases of selecting for certain signals. Well, now the question is, are, is would that signal selection be as good if they were all, if all the tissue was bad versus some of the neuron light? Well, you just can't do that with other models. Um, you can start to ask those questions in something like an organoid, or I think to get back to your migraine and then I'll stop talking. Um, what is the difference between epileptic discharge and this sort of spreading depression or these depolarization events that happen in migraine? Well, um, you can look at that cell by cell and see how the cell signature might react. Well, you might learn more by seeing how these very early quasi networks across cellular tissue like this interacts between a, a, migra a, a migranor and a non-migranor. Or to get back to the therapy question, what would it mean if a standard drug that we use for migraine prevention like propranolol were to affect a bundle of organoid tissue from someone who responded well to propranolol? Uh, and not to verapamil, which is just, just as well a, a reasonable drug to use, and vice versa. If I had the cellular uh, culture based out of somebody who was a verapamil responder, but not a propranolol responder. Well, if you can see what that might look like across the organoid, you start to be able to ask the question, how? Just in a way that you couldn't if it were just a, a bunch of cells swirling around. So I'd like to stay with you for, for a minute, or Michael. And by the way, there are a lot of fantastic questions coming in. So I'm going to turn to you all pretty pretty soon. Uh, but just, you know, thinking about different disease states that might be uh, therapeutically addressed through research with organoids. I mean, we touched on some of them, but can you, while we're chatting, can you just give us a span of areas of research into possible therapeutic, um, you know, approaches? We've I think we mentioned Alzheimer's, if the migraines are there, what are the, what's the span of things that people should be aware of that organoid research could help with? Well, uh, uh, keeping organoid research specific to uh, uh, nervous uh, nervous tissue, That's you know, uh, brain yes. or, or, or neuron. Going um, to okay. um, work noise. Yes, yeah. thank you. But because uh, uh, that's, that's quite broad. But that's even and then, uh, it can go anywhere from as complex as some of the work that that Annie is interested in, where where, where she's focusing on uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, and even asking like, what does that mean? Where along development are those pathologic changes? Well, uh, as Annie mentioned. That organoid is a very early version of what's going to develop way down the line. And one concept to keep in mind is, in, especially for neurodevelopmental disorders, but maybe even for neurodegenerative disorders, how early is the mistake in the genetic signature? How early is the insult that you might get you know, from the outside uh, intrauterinely onto that embryo? What is the particular mark? And then how the rest of that whole system accommodates it, we can't get from other kinds of models in the way that we, other kinds of simple models in the way that you can from an organoid. So what, what do I mean by this? Um, have you ever seen those pictures of a tree where it's got like an ax in it and the tree has grown around it? Or like, you know, there's a bicycle that was next to that tree and the tree has somehow incorporated it? Well, think about it. Development, to some extent, for that which survives, means accommodating pathologies, right? 
as bad as our pathology may be, we're all still walking around or talking around or existing at least, right? Which means that whole complicated nervous system that for neurotypical people runs along smoothly still has to run along somehow. And so the organoid allows you in some ways to think about what are the accommodations that the rest of the tissue might make for this one pathological problem and start to make inferences as guessing, inferences and guesses about even further down the uh, what's not being modeled developmentally. So if we said, uh, what was it, seven weeks or six weeks or you know, 12 weeks of, uh, well, okay, what do those changes that are pathologic now and the adjustments for that bad pathology, what does that mean for the 36 week or uh, the two year or the 26 year old in a case of something like schizophrenia or the 62 year old in cases like something like early onset Alzheimer's? Thank you, Michael. I'd like to just stick with you for what, one last question because I'd sort of like to start to shift our conversation to, so we've heard a lot about the different elements that organoids raise for us, you know, some of them uh, you know, really productive ways to explore new research approaches and, and application approaches. We've heard, you know, not to worry about some things like, you know, immediate consciousness in a tube, which is not going to happen. Um, but but just thinking ahead a little bit uh, before I go to the audience questions, how should how should policy leaders be thinking about this area? You, know, you and I, Michael, talked about you know differences between say legislation and community guidelines, you know around things like brain related tissue. Uh, you know people get sensitive, and Lomax YouTube might want to comment on this too. I would say definitely I want Lomax to comment on this because yeah. I, I actually really much more want to know yeah. what he what, what he thinks. But but what, what uh, we had sort of discussed and what we might unpack today for everybody else is just the thought of there are ethical questions that are related to the source tissue, right? Doesn't matter what it's doing. It matters where it's from. And that's one kind of uh, ethical framework. And there's a lot of legislation in which goes back and forth uh, on that subject. So uh, in other words, there is certain legislation or certain ways that a legislature might write a, a, a policy statement where uh, the work that Annie does is fruit of the poisonous tree. There's nothing that on its own is particularly objectionable to the organoid other than where it might have come from, right? So that's one area for which um, uh, Annie or myself are kind of helpless in what we would do legislatively because uh, it's, it's, it's earlier upstream. Then there's uh, certain questions that are more about uh, good practice. Um, they're almost kind of professionalism, but for sciences or for academics. Um, there is this intrinsic understanding, at least since the age of reason, um, on what the role of an academic is and their role to society. And so um, society trusts us with a lot of stuff. It trusts us with their tax dollars, they trust us with the reports that we give and that we're accurate and honest. So um, in there and embedded in there is the idea that for the field itself, for a number of things that are too complex or too abstruse or too esoteric, we actually have some leeway to self-police. So that's not necessarily a legislative issue, but it is one of being able to say that we do have a professional statement. We do have guidelines or standard operating practice, and we make those explicit and at least as understandable as we can to a lay public. So what I would say is for the question of the organoid, that which already seems to be implicated or policies are impinging on its status probably will always hang out in legislative circles. Uh, and, and, you know, you should solicit your uh, congressman for. Uh, and then um, the others are really things that depend on on scientists and their ethical framework, which is a, a reaffirmation of the trust that we have with that group. Max, I'd love your further thoughts as well. Oh, that was so eloquent. How could I follow up? Uh, oh, <laughs> I... Um, I, th I think it's worth sort of, you know, highlighting that I think a lot of the policy making and sort of ethical discourse around brain organoids is at least to some degree sort of the inheritor of sort of previous debates, um, you know, starting like in the 70s with recombinant DNA, you know, being able to engineer DNA and then sort of later stem cell technology. And there was always this sort of question about like, you know, well, where do we draw the line? 
you know, where is sort of that ethical line of sort of demarcation? And I think we're sort of entering a somewhat new phase where sort of the lines aren't unimportant, but I think we're we're entering a phase where the debates or the deliberation, I think is a sort of more accurate term, needs to sort of be the product of the exchange between academia, policy sort of makers, and, and the public. And in sort of academic circles, they call this sort of anticipatory governance. This isn't something that, you know, elite, you know, um, elitist or sort of academics are saying, here's where the line is and should be, but it's saying, well, perhaps where, how should we proceed, you know, given what the goals are of stakeholders that have a, a stake in the, the knowledge to derive from these, you know, disease advocacy stakeholders, you know, other sort of stakeholders. Because ethics, you know, science is about the, the what and the how and sometimes the why. You know, ethics is really about the ought. You know, what ought we do given certain, you know, benefits, known benefits, unknown benefits, cost, unknown cost. And sort of, you know, what are we willing to do given sort of, you know, things that we that we value, the alleviation of sort of disease. And I think this sort of iterative approach to anticipatory governance will enable us to sort of move forward <clears throat> in a way that's sort of ethically sort of grounded in what the community um, writ large, you know, deems as sort of morally justifiable at that at that point in time. And I think right now, you know, the the legitimate sort of tangible ethical issues are less on sort of abstract philosophical concepts of like cognition and, and consciousness, but are sort of related to what Michael was talking about in terms of the a lot of the ethical questions are focused not on the organoids themselves, but on sort of the people that are upstream of organoids. You know, this is around consent. This is around um, biobanking. This is around commercialization with um, tissue that could have been consented under different contexts in the past. And sort of all of these things that relate to how patents work and to how um, cost sharing and sort of revenue sharing sort of are, are going to be um, decided upon are really, I think, the, the most relevant sort of ethical issues that we're, that we're facing right now. And that's where policymaking should be informed by what the scientists are learning in the lab, what the public feels are sort of um, you know valuable pursuits and what sort of um, doable from a legal perspective. Thank you, Lomax. I mean, thinking about the, so I really love this uh, the ought uh, for you know an ethical lens, and then the the what, the how, and the why. And thinking about the what, the how, and the and the why, uh, I'd like to come back to you, Annie, and then I'll start taking audience questions. Because I'm I'm wondering what your you know what are interesting. Uh, you know, research directions that you're kind of excited about as you look forward in the context of, you know, your your research lens? Um, one of the most uh, uh, exciting, as Michael pointed it out, is the advantage of using it for looking at a breadth of neurological diseases. And and the ability of it to track across the developmental points when we're growing these and we can actually from a science and a nerd point of view I would say to look at it grow in the lab from one millimeter or a cells in a dish to an actual tissue that's almost of a small size of a pea is amazing and it's kind of fascinating and if I talk to most of my students they usually say is this even for real? <laughs> is this sci-fi? What are you doing? You're growing brains in a dish. And that concept in itself is exciting. And understanding, there's a couple of things I would say. One is understanding the human brain. It's one of the biggest mysteries of human race. What is the human brain? How does it develop? How does it function the way it functions? The ability for us to think, talk, have these thoughts, think about the future perception, consciousness, all those kinds of questions. I don't know right now they can be answered, but in the future, as we grow with these organoids, I think the brain organoids will give us some idea or a glimpse in how the brain functions. So that's just a developmental biologist talking. And then from a medical point of view, looking at these diseases, following the neurological diseases, the bre breadth of development, uh, that's another fascinating kind of way of looking at these diseases. 
most neurological diseases, the drugs fail in pharma because uh, we do it in animals and the animal brains are fantastic, but they don't cover what our brain does and how our brain functions and develops, so they fail. And Alzheimer's is an example, several others. So this gives us an idea to look at drugs and potentially do drug studies in live human brain tissue with patient samples. So that's another aspect of it. And the last aspect uh, I would say is once these things grow, they are electrically active. They have the ability, the neurons can communicate with each other. I'm not saying they're developing consciousness, please do not go there. But uh, I'm saying they can form these networks and form communication patterns. And can we actually check these communication patterns with actual patient data? And that's what I'm very fascinated about. Can we compare for an example, and I'm throwing it out there, the electrical functions that we generate from these brain organoids to EEG patterns that patients we get? And that's what that I'm hoping to do in the future. So this is some of the examples. I bet there's going to be questions on this. <laughs> yeah, there are so many questions. I mean, let, let, let's have a go at tackling them. Some of them I may need to sort of combine to try to fit as many as, as we can. Um, but but um, they fall mainly in two buckets. One is around mechanisms of the organoids themselves and how you make them and another is how to how to use them kind of in research going forward so but let me start with the mechanisms ones first or ones i'm thinking of is that way um first i you know this this sort of bridges naturally annie from from what you were just saying but maybe others uh, could comment it as well um it says could could different brain organoids be developed to mimic specific neurological disorders. And I think that was implicit, but maybe you can answer that explicitly. Yes. Uh, so the answer is yes. The uh, technology of the iPSCs that I started with, the induced pluripotent stem cells, where we can actually get derived stem cells from the patients, gives us the ability to carry that genetic signature that the patient has. So let's say a person has, or a kid has autism and we wanna look at autism and how it develops from that patient. We can specifically do it from that patient. I myself have derived from a children hair cells into stem cells and these brain organoids, and then looked at that brain organoid cellularly molecularly developing and found deficits in the organoid from that patient. And we uh, then talk to a pharma company and then put drugs on those organoids to rectify that cellular molecular problem that that organoid showed. And it did some recovery. And then we went back to the patient and gave them that drug. And they were happy to take it pending all the ethical logistical uh, approvals that has not cannot be discounted for but yes so the answer is yes we can model the organoids uh, for different disorders and this one is directly related can you build specific brain structures or like brain structures for instance it says could a mini hippocampus be built Yes, so we in our lab do all kinds of uh, uh, we brain organoids. So we have derived, so this is an example behind me is a cerebral prefrontal cortex organoid. You can derive hippocampal, which is the learning memory center of the brain. And that is particularly used for Alzheimer's disease as a model. Uh, we've also made uh, retinal organoids, uh, motor organoids, so motor neurons in the brain to look at ALS and mm -hmm. other disorders. So but depending on the disorder, we can, yes, define the brain structure because we have from clinical studies, the inkling where the disease is going to occur or has occurred previously. And this one is also sort of related. Oh, no, Max, go ahead, please. Did you have something you want to add? Yeah, yeah, please. I just I just wanted to add because, you know, I think there's there's some sort of assumptions that have been made sort of in the past in neuroscience about relating specific brain structures to like behaviors or sort of cognitive mm -hmm. capacities. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just worth clarifying that in the case of 
uh, brain organoids. We can create, you know, organoids that have that express, you know, markers or genes that are found in the hippocampus or found in the sort of the cerebral cortex. But sort of the attribution of a, you know, something like memory or higher executive function um, to a particular brain region has only been made in the context of the entire brain, um, in which organoids are sort of lacking. And so even if you made a, a hippocampus, if you will, sort of in a brain organoid, it it's it's sort of unclear and would likely lack a lot of the in vivo functions that the hippocampus does within the context of all the other sort of brain regions. And it's also sort of worth noting that in the case of the cerebral cortex, where people often associate with higher cognitive function, brain organoids express many of those markers that we see in the brain, but they lack many of the architectural features that we think are important, like the layers, like the cerebral cortex in an adult neurotypical human has six layers. The organoid doesn't really have any. They're all kind of jumbled up in like a disorganized way that has only the very rudimentary basis of sort of layers. And so these systems are, are very good at looking at, you know, things happening at the genetic and sort of cellular level. But as soon as you move up from cellular systems to networks and sort of higher um, hierarchical systems, um, we got to be really sort of careful um, in sort of how we how we describe them, how we talk about them. Yeah, all right. Oh, sorry, Michael. Go oh, ahead. I was going to say uh, just just to help people get a sense of the implication of what what that means, what's sort of at stake between when Annie and Will Max were saying. Let's say you have one of those old tube radios, you know, and uh, you, you're listening to the Lone Ranger, and all of a sudden, boop, episode shuts off. So you call the TV repair guy, and he shows up, and he flips the back of it, and there's four tubes back there. He's got to figure out which one's the bad tube. Well, he unscrews the first tube, puts a new one in. No. Nope. Okay, puts that one back. Unscrews the second one, puts a new one in. Pop. Lone Ranger's back on. Now, the Lone Ranger doesn't live in tube two. Right? In other words, this whole system, this mm -hmm. apparatus that's designed to then catch something external to it, process it, and make it available to you. Um, uh, is not contained. The actual thing I'm looking for, the phenomenon, is not contained just in tube two. However, you need tube two to make the thing work. So we're studying how do I make the filament that and like the glass, and then maybe I'll get to the point that I can make tube two, right? So that's that's sort of how early we are in this in this modeling process and what part of the whole system we're trying to model. Um, just to underscore Lomax's point that, you know, we're not studying memory, at, uh, qua memory. Uh. Um, thank you. That's really, I like that image a lot. Um, I'm going to ask one sort I of- I stole that. That's not mine. Uh, no, it's I, nice I, one. <laughs> I'm going to ask one more sort of mechanical one, and then I'm going to get a little harder. <laughs> so the next mechanical one uh, is an in, in the lab question. If you're- uh, creating organoids in a lab when you start to do that do they self-organize uh, organize uh, organize <laughs> or do they have to be guided in some way this is the question I just we do when we grow these cerebral organoids they're different different people have different protocols so every different lab has their different protocols and they have different ways of guiding and the stem cells into the different cellular types uh, I would say and so it's a mixture for me for me in my personal lab we it's a mixture of some chemical guidance and then after a month of growing self-organization so it's a mix of both I would say thank you so now let's get a little a little trickier territory. Um, I thought this was a fascinating question, um, and the, this the the person writes, you know, thanks for a fascinating discussion. If neural circuits are refined by sensory experience, might organoids disassociated from sensory input be misleading as models in some ways for brain disease? I don't know if this is the area of speculation or if we can talk about limitations there. It's more like it. Um, so yes, it is an area of limitation. Um, we do not get, it is literally by, as Lomax pointed out, a clump of 
neurons or neuronal subtypes of cells or brain cell types, and it doesn't have any sensory input as of yet. And uh, the field is moving towards getting sensory input. So we electrically stimulate them to get a sensory or some kind of sensory or stimulation for the organoid. We have chemical stimulation as well with that we perform. So it's accurate enough to, well, I would not say accurate, simplistic enough to do a disease model. Uh, and uh, the other sensory cues, you can go into now the sphere of assembloids where they're trying to put multiple organoids together and trying to get one to sensory input the other and then causing the developmental of disease modeling. So right now it is a limitation. The field is trying different methods of giving sensory input, at least in a technical point of view. Thank you. And um, I would, I would just, I would just add if, if you, if you wanted me to, uh, Maria, that you know, um, you know, I mean, sensory information does not the cerebral cortex make. You know, your 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 cerebral cortex will develop um, many of the features. You know, um, you know, without sensory input, although that's kind of a difficult thing to sort of test. I think what's, what's sort of interesting, and we immediately go to sort of the forefront here of where the field is, is like, how does you know, sensory information sculpt the self-organizing properties that we're observing in these brain organoids that don't have external input. You know, they're capable of generating internal input and, and internal you know, spontaneous sort of network activities. And so how does sort of sensory input or input in any way, because, you know, not all brain systems, brain regions are exposed to sensory input. They're received input from other brain regions, you know, but how does sort of incoming information sculpt um, how neural networks um, function, how neural networks sort of reorganize themselves in light of experience. Um, these are all like right there sort of at, at the forefront of I think where the field is and is, and is going in the, the near future. Uh, another question about, about, about use in, in research, could organoid technology potentially replace animal testing in the future? Who wants to take that one? Michael, do you want to take that one? No, no, <laughs> absolutely not. No, it, it all has to, again, it's, it's sort of like um, what tool in your toolbox gets the particular job done? So if if the organoid, um, if the organoid is a screwdriver, then it works great for if what you have is a screw, right? And if the mouse is a hammer and what you really need is to hammer something in, like you could do it. I mean, you could hammer a screw into a piece of wood, but that's not really what it's designed to do. And it's not going to be the best hold. So again, I, I, these are, we should be able to use to some extent, synonymously model and tool. Model is a tool to answer a particular question or accomplish a particular task. And there are some, um, some particular uh, tasks in biomedicine that are just done better. Um, with an, an organism that is a, an organism, completely intact system uh, to accomplish a, a task versus an organoid, a portion of a system um, that, that has greater control over um, its elements. So no, I, I, don't think, I don't think animal models are going away anywhere and anytime soon. Thank you so much. I, think I, would, I, would, I would add to that as well that... Um, it's, this is, I think, a, a perfect example of sort of where like anticipatory governance can sort of have a role because it's a bit, it's, a, it's an empirical question, right? Does the development of drugs um, lead through brain organoids or other organoids lead to more efficacious clinical trials than sort of animal models? You know, we mentioned earlier that, you know, many um, drugs sort of fail clinical trials. Well, you touch a number of that. Ninety percent of drugs fail clinical trials for a myriad of reasons that we don't really completely understand. And so, as the field goes forward, if that number starts to sort of move up, hopefully, you know, in light of sort of brain organoids, we'll have sort of an empirical basis for designing policies about the use of animals, sort of in research. Um, yeah, it, it's very unlikely that a brain organ will ever replace sort of the 
pharmacokinetics that occur within an entire entire organism. But it's worth paying attention to what's going to happen with clinical trials in the future, given information that can be provided by organoid systems. Thank you. I think maybe we could fit one more. I think we have about three minutes uh, or so left. And I, I would just, I thought this was interesting. So everybody's talking about organoids and everybody's also talking about AI lately. So there's a question here, if, if anybody might be able to share some thoughts, uh, what do you have? Do you have any thoughts on the new field of organoid intelligence, which seeks to use these structures as computers? Um, the questioner says something similar has been already been done for a long time, growing neurons on circuits and having them play fight simulator or control a robot. But now researchers may seek to grow actual 3D structures. And it's being talked about as the next thing beyond AI, sometimes referred to as OI. Uh, I hadn't heard that yet myself, but does anybody have any thoughts they might be able? I know we're not experts here in AI and organoids, but if you had anything to suggest to learn more or share, I thought that would be awesome. Probably worth... Uh... Uh, disclosing that I'm I'm on the organoid intelligence research team <laughs> uh, at Hopkins, um, and yeah, I, mean, I think you know, and this circles back to a previous sort of question uh, that was raised about sort of the role of sensory input. Um, you know, we are sort of exploring ways of integrating brain organoid technology with sort of artificial intelligence systems, so that a developing organoid can send out electrical inputs and sort of receive electrical feedback in a way that's sort of tailored to what's going on sort of within the system. And this is sort of one of the sort of the hopes of this system is that we can sort of create, um, you know, experimental systems for looking at how brain organoid um, electrical activity and development is sort of shaped by the input of like incoming information. Um, there's a lot of potential downstream applications that are 110% speculative. Um, but we do, we, we do know that neurological systems, you know, can sort of respond in a dynamic way to sort of incoming information. And we really want to understand sort of how the nuts and bolts of that process works. And OI is sort of one approach to doing that. Amazing. I, I am sad that we have to actually call our conversation to a close now because this sort of dynamic iteration is, has been fascinating for me. I hope everybody can join me in thanking, you know, with a virtual round of applause, our wonderful, wonderful speakers today. Uh, it was a, a fascinating discussion. Please do fill out the survey when you get it, attendees, if you would, it'll help, you'll help us do a better job. And I also want to just mention that this is the first of a series of disco data discovery dialogues, uh, discussions around areas of neuroscience and, and neuroethics and technologies. The next one is on creativity and neurodiversity. It will be November 29th, a Wednesday from 3 to 4 East Coast time. Hope to see you there. Thanks again so much and have a wonderful rest of your week and day. And thank you again. Wonderful speakers.